Welcome to lecture number nine, Social and Urban Reform. So in Europe, industrial capitalism became a subject of interest for photographers uh, in the late part of the 19th century as they recorded images of urban life for various purposes. So let's take a look at London in the middle of the 19th century. In 1851, social researcher and freelance journalist Henry Mayhew published London Labor and the London Poor that we see here. And this included illustrations and engravings based on daguerreotypes. The book is concerned with many of the trades and habits, um, the religion and the domestic arrangements of thousands of people that were working in the streets of the city of London. Mayhew interviewed hundreds of subjects, including some street beggars, some sweatshop workers, prostitutes, peddlers, street performers, and the homeless itinerants, or what was referred to as mudlarks, that lived along the banks of the Thames. His content was considered shocking by many, as Mayhew was unapologetically direct in his descriptions of these people and the conditions in which they lived. Photographers also undertook documentations of economic and ethnic types of people in collections of carte de visite during the late 19th century. In Russia, William Carrick and others documented the street vendors of St. Petersburg. It wasn't uncommon to see collections of images of people that were dressed in work clothes, holding the tools of their trade or their wares, as we see here in Reshnashiki, street seller of St. Petersburg. Jay Monstein was another documenter of Russian types. These are, of course, staged portraits of the working class, because you can see these people are in a studio set up with the kinds of things that you would normally find them working with. In Glasgow, Scotland, we have The Old Closes and Streets of Glasgow by Thomas Annan. Glasgow's population had quadrupled from 1800 to 1850, and with the rise in population came a rise in poverty and poor tenement living conditions. The Glasgow City Improvement Trust hired Thomas Annan, who was a well-known photographer at the time, to document the older, decrepit, and run-down parts of the cities before raising and rebuilding them. Though not a social reformer himself, Annan's images provide some of the earliest comprehensive series of phot photographs of an urban slum, the very slum which was considered to be the worst in Great Britain. Similarly, in Paris, under the Baron Houseman, Char Charles Marville is hired to document vast areas of old Paris that were torn down and rebuilt to create a more modern city of wider boulevards and open spaces. And here we see the people as opposed to the structures becoming the focus as John Thompson undertakes a survey of London's poor for a publica publication called Street Life in London that was issued in installments beginning in 1877 with accompanying text by Adolf Smith. The public was interested in these publications as government-sponsored welfare programs were beginning to be accepted as part of modern life. Crawlers were old women that were so feeble from hunger and lack of sleep that they literally crawled on their hands and knees to beg for their bread and hot water for tea. Thomas Barnardo, an Irish evangelical minister, administered homes and training programs for poor and homeless children in London, and he made hundreds of before and after photographs that were essentially to advertise his services and raise funds to support his program. He would sell the images in packs of 20 cards for five shillings. And Barnardo tended to exaggerate his subjects' poverty, dressing them in torn clothing, etc. So he was accused of over-dramatizing his photographs, but he countered that by saying that he was merely doing what painters do, creating fictions that aimed for higher truth. Some early street photography Paul Martin of London. So in London, 
Paul Martin, who is a journalist, also begins recording street life in a very casual snapshot style. So a lot of his images have a real kind of immediacy about them, a real sense of movement, and not necessarily the kind of precise framing that you might see in other photographers' work. So this is a really new view of London, a non-posed, busy, bustling city scene. And some criticize this style of imagery as amateurish and unskilled, but it differed greatly from prior images of people in the streets as it was immediate and unposed in its feel. And over in New York, we have E. Alice Austin. So in the 1890s, hundreds of thousands of immigrants are pouring into the United States, primarily through New York and the West Coast and settling into the major cities. In 1900, over 35% of the populations of large cities such as New York and Chicago were foreign born. Alice Austin, was a Staten Island socialite and a photographer of her own circle, but she also completed a large study of, quote, street types in the busy streets of New York City. So here we see a rag picker, and here we have an immigrant and pretzel vendor. And finally, a peddler of sponges. So they're really kind of a great view of what the streets actually looked like in New York at this time and the kinds of things that people were wearing and the kinds of things that people were buying and selling. So in Chicago, we have Sigmund Krauss. And he makes a series of lantern slides in Chicago documenting the various street workers. And many of Krausch's images reinforce ethnic stereotypes and cliches about the urban poor. So here we see an image of rag pickers again. Poor immigrants searched garbage bins for scraps of clothing or rags, and the scraps were sold to junk dealers or they were kept and reused. The press generally disapproved of rag pickers and particularly harbored prejudices against poor Italians singling them out as, quote, ignorant and dirty. So the magic lantern was something that began in the 1840s and lasted until the invention of Kodachrome in 1935. Often images were hand-painted on glass, but photographs were also made into lantern slides. So here we see an example of a magic lantern. So it looks a lot like a kind of a movie projector. Um, so the size of the slides that would be placed into the machine were three and a half inches by four inches. And the process that was used to create these slides was an albumin coating on glass, then collodion, uh, and then eventually the dry plate. Um, and the very first projectors used oil lamps for light. But by the 1870s, limelight, which was produced by burning oxygen and hydrogen on a pellet of lime, offered a better, although more dangerous, form of illumination. And then in the 1890s, the invention of the carbon arc lamp comes about, followed by electric light, providing a much safer method for displaying the lantern slide image. So back to looking at Krausch's images. In many families, children under 14 brought in as much as a third of the family's income. Children worked as boot blacks, newsboys, street vendors, cigar makers, and in many other jobs. So one can clearly see that these images were posed in a studio type setting with this kind of neutral backdrop as if to imitate the documentation style of ethnographic photographs. And clearly Crouch has, has these guys posed in such a way that is also uh, kind of suggesting flaws in their character in some cases, as we see here with this man holding a bottle as he's supposed to be sweeping. Also want to talk about Arnold Genthy, 
who photographed San Francisco in a kind of an interesting way. So on the West Coast, we have um, Arnold Genthy, Arnold Genthy, who shortly after he arrives in California from Germany in 1895, he begins wandering the streets of Chinatown with a hidden camera. And he's really intent on recording the surviving vestiges of old world traditions in the very thriving ethnic enclave that Chinatown was and is. Over the next 10 years, he returned repeatedly to what was known as the Canton of the West, finally publishing the photographs as a book called Pictures of Old Chinatown in 1908. His work was undertaken for purely personal desires. But of course, what's interesting about his work is that he is hiding the camera. So these images are all candid. These people don't know that they are being photographed. So these images have the effect of producing a glimpse into the daily life of Chinatown. Get these images of San Francisco's Chinatown become an important historical document in California. All right, so now I want to talk about social reform photography, beginning with a man named Jacob Rees. So Jacob Rees was a Danish immigrant. He worked as a carpenter and in a number of other blue collar jobs in New York City. And he often slept in police hostels and tenement housing with many other immigrants. He eventually became a journalist in New York City during the late 19th century. And he'd been writing about the brutality of life in New York City slums and began to take pictures after he invested in a small four by five box view camera. And he was interested in showing what quote, no mere description could, the misery and vice that he had noticed, and to suggest the direction in which good might be done, end quote. Reese's photos were featured in Flashes from the Slums, pictures taken in dark places by the lightning process. This is a, was an illustrated newspaper article in The Sun. So Reese was an early user of magnesium powder, and the sudden burst of light in the darkness created images of startled looking subjects. The snapshot look of the photographs also helped to lend credibility to his subject matter. So Reese and his companions modified the flash powder mixture because it burned instantaneously in a flash. It was an improvement over the magnesium flare with its several seconds duration, which O'Sullivan, Timothy O'Sullivan, had used in the Comstock load mines, if you remember those images. In describing this image, he said, on either side of the alley are the stale beer dives in room after room, where the stuff is sold for two or three cents a quart. After buying a round, the customer's entitled to a seat on the floor, otherwise known as a lodging for the night. Here we have the all night two cent restaurant in the bend. Reese's images do not come with a neutral view. Reese divided the poor into two categories, deserving and undeserving. Deserving for him were usually women and children, and undeserving included unemployed men and criminals. The use of flash powder for artificial lighting and photography was not only still experimental, it was actually dangerous. The magnesium-based flash powder used by Reese is essentially the same technology upon which modern stun grenades are based. So because no device had yet been invented for using flash powder as a photographic aid, Reese relied on a cast iron frying pan. He would set up his camera, which was a pretty cumbersome large format unit on a wooden tripod, open the shutter, and then close his eyes and ignite the flash. Once he actually set his own clothing on fire, and twice he set the establishments he was photographing on fire. <laughs> 
but the photographs that resulted from this process changed New York City. Couple more of Reese images. Here's a couple of other Reese images. Here's I Scrubs from Children of the Poor in 1892. And Battle Alley, Wyo Gang's headquarters from The Battle with the Slum in 1902. So in 1890, Reese publishes a book called How the Other Half Lives, including photo images, text, and illustrations. He lectured on the topic and projected lantern slides to illustrate his points. His belief was that the unsanitary tenements were the cause of the crime and moral decay. Reese wasn't looking for government to legislate change. Rather, he was imploring for charity from the wealthy and private investors. His photos did, however, lead to some housing regulations that outlawed overcrowded quarters and windowless rooms. The second person I want to talk about today is Lewis Hine. So Lewis Hine studied sociology at Chicago and New York universities. He became a teacher at the Ethical Culture School in New York. And he took up photography as a means of expressing his social concerns. In 1908, Hind left his teaching position for a full-time job as an investigative photographer for the National Child Labor Committee. This was then conducting a major campaign against the exploitation of American children in the workplace. So the NCLC, the National Child Labor Committee, was urging legislative control of industrial hiring practices. So this is an image before he started that work. Um, this image uses a very traditional format of the Madonna and child, and in a way uh, helping to elicit sympathy for newly arrived immigrants, a Madonna of the tenements. So from 1908 to 1912, Hine took his camera across America to photograph children as young as three years old working for long hours, often under dangerous conditions in factories, in mines, and fields. And in 1909, he published the first of many photo essays depicting working children at risk. Using a smaller 5 by 7 view camera called a Graflex, rather than looking through an upside-down image on a rear-facing ground glass, Hind could view his images by looking down into a viewfinder and a top ground glass. Here's an example of that kind of camera. And just stepping back for a minute, this is one of Hind's most famous images images, child in Carolina cotton mill in 1908. Here's a photo of Hine using his camera to photograph an inner city slum in 1910. And here's the, the gal in the cotton mill photograph again. So a little bit of info, one of the spinners in the Whitnell cotton mill, she was 51 inches high She'd been in the mill for one year, sometimes working at night, runs four sides at 48 cents a day. When asked how old she was, she hesitated, then said, I don't remember. Then added confidently, I'm not old enough to work, but I do just the same. Out of 50 employees, there were 10 children about her size in Whitnell, North Carolina. Here's a spinner in the New England mill. And here's Breaker Boys. Hine documented numerous gross violations of laws protecting young children. At many of the locations he visited, youngsters were quickly rushed out of his sight. He was also told that youngsters in the mill or factory had just stopped by for a visit or were helping their mothers. Attempts at child labor reform continued and were aided by the widespread publicity from Heinz photographs. As a result, many states passed stricter laws banning the employment of underage children. 
And finally, in 1938, Congress passed the Fair Labor Standards Act, better known as the Federal Wage and Hour Law. So notice these boys working in a coal mine And here we've got young cigar makers. Three boys looked under 14. Labor leaders told me in busy times, many small boys and girls were employed. Youngsters all smoke. A quote from Lewis Hines' book. Here's one of the boys at a glass factory. And a boy carrying homework from a New York sweatshop, meaning he's got to work on it at home. So Heinz's work, as opposed to Jacob Rees's documentation of the poor, is a precursor to modern social work. Hein encouraged the use of photography by the workers themselves. Though the early 20th century was an active time for the formation of labor unions in industrialized nations, photography as a tool for these organizations was slow to catch on. Instead, corporations such as the Pullman Company and the Ford Motor Company took up the use of the camera to promote their working conditions and corporate philosophies. Hein continued to photograph the urban poor and the labor pool, as we see in this 1920 image of a mechanic at a steam pump. His later photography clearly demonstrates both technical improvement and an eye for modernism, as we see here with man on girders and the Empire State Building. And the last photographer I want to talk about today is Paul Strand. So we talked a little bit about him at the end of the last lecture when we were talking um, about Alfred Stieglitz's moment of change, right? So Paul Strand was originally a student of Lewis Hines' Ethical Culture School, and he focused on individual faces and characters in his images of the New York City poor. So these are a few of Strand's images. Strand eventually abandoned this type of documentary work and pursued a more formal modernist aesthetic emphasizing form over content, inspiring the straight photography movement that evolved on the West Coast in the 1920s and 30s. And that's the end of today's lecture. Thanks for listening.